Hey, PSA, same PSA, different episode. Skateboarders, are you out there? Please, if you skate and listen to this podcast, send me at least one clip of yourself skating, talkingschmidt at gmail.com, trying to put together a video of us all for the end of the year. Want you in there. Double action. Do this sick right here. Do, 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 do. Boom, 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 boom. All right, this is uh, Chris Coke. You're listening to Talking Smith. Let's do it. Hey, hey, hey. Talking Schmidt. I'm already not watching. It's cool. Like, tonight is the night. Damn, this is like the coolest thing I'm ever going to do. I wouldn't say it was fun. What do you mean? Well, Christian Fletcher's younger brother. Fuck the Dodgers. Oh, big dog's in. What do you think, Dolan? Beyond Schmitty. Talking Schmidt. Alpha macaroni. Most of these guys, their opinion don't matter. Talking Schmidt, right? It's skateboarding. I remember that. Talking Schmidt. What are Yuns doing? Holy shit. Skateboarding homies. No, Schmidt, you can't jump in. What is happening? I'm here for Yay! Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Wi-Fi check one, Wi-Fi check two. Let's do it indeed. All right, kids, we are back with another episode. And today we have, I don't know, we're going to do true or false on this. True or false, my next guest was the first person to do an invert to egg. This is Chris Cope. Is that true or false? I didn't know about anyone doing it. I heard it was that Chris May through the grapevine. I heard Lance say that Chris May had did one and it was called a May tag. What the fuck is that? Was that the same thing? I I don't know, but somehow just through the grapevine, I heard that it was called a May tag or something like that. Okay. Well, Lance would probably know. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would assume that he did. You know, having the the vert ramp in his yard, he probably saw a bunch of, you know, random stuff that didn't get recorded back in the day. You know, for sure, I know. I'd love to see what didn't get recorded at uh, Manor. Man, the sessions they had there looked amazing. Yeah, definitely some iconic photos coming from coming from that ramp. Let's go back to the early days, though. I don't know much about like your upbringing. You, you're from Texas, right? Yes, uh, I'm from a uh, Cold Spring, Texas. Cold Spring. Where's is like that by town. Houston? It's in between Houston and Dallas. Oh, okay. It's like eight hundred people, so a really small town. Oh, damn. Okay. Yeah. Right. And how'd you get into skating? Like, did you was it through school or a uh, brother or something or like? I have two older brothers that skated back then, and they they had one friend that skated too. And so anything they did, I just thought was the coolest, you know, I carbon copied like everything they did, you know, music and hobbies and stuff like that. So I had to learn how to skate to keep up with them. They're like five and six years older than me. So that's how I got into it. And otherwise no one else in the town skated. So if it wasn't for them, I would have never really got into it. Did you guys have some weird local spot, like some random ditch or anything that was, like was rad that you guys would go to and like learn some shit? Or um, we had super good hills in our neighborhood. Oh, that were paid really well, and it's so out in the middle of nowhere that like you could bomb hills and not really worry about cars so much. So, um, and that's how you got around the neighborhood was like to the lake and to different parts. But then uh, my Dad built a five foot mini ramp for him at one point ah. that didn't last long, maybe like two years tops or something like that. And I was about nine, nine, ten when that was going on. So you kind of learned how to skate fast early on, though, bombing down hills and stuff like that. Was that kind of the key? Like for us, it was all about trying to go as fast as you could go and then go a little faster. Yeah, at first it was just to keep up with uh, my brothers that were skating, you know, just mm. to keep up. So you had you had to learn to be able to keep up. And then to get to the lake was all downhill from my house. So 
I was taking that a lot and then eventually learned that you could maybe push it and go faster. Then we'd find like bigger hills on purpose. Yeah. It, it turned into that. Okay. Any early on like wipeouts that were like a substantial? Not like early on, but I remember trying to do a nollie over a crack at the bottom of a hill and then waking up in the, in the, in the street and then wondering why I was sleeping in the street. I was like, um, Oh, this is a weird take a nap <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man when i was 12 uh there was a hill right by my house and we we were on bmx's at the time and i was on the sidewalk and i decided i could go down the hill with no handed and at the bottom of the hill i hit one of those driveway dips and went over the handlebars and i woke up in a church and it was like, <laughs> dude, my mom and dad were there. Like, I don't know what happened, how long I was out, but my face was all swollen. I couldn't see out of one eye. And it was just uh, like, there was a church that was like a half a block away. And later they told me, they're like, yeah, the, I guess a nun came out and got me. And some, I think I had ID somehow. Somebody figured out who my parents were. And then, yeah, that was a crazy early one. I think, uh, those ones where you get knocked out are, are fucking scary. Yeah, it'd be a weird way to wake up, like inside of a church and like looking at a stained glass window or, or something. And you're just like, what happened? <laughs> yeah. And like one, I was shut closed too. So it was crazy. Oh, that was the worst thing I'd ever seen in my whole life. Did you get into like mm, following skateboarding at all while you were there? Or did that not happen until you moved out to California? Like, did you have influences of like, you know, pros or anybody that was extra ripper? Um, there's like a long time of just not having any accessibility to like magazines or videos, like skate shops are really far away. Mm. So there was like minimal exposure to that for like a, a good period until maybe I was like 14, 15. I started seeing like random people would have a video or something that they didn't care about. And I would just watch it a bunch. Right. But, um, then the fuel TV and blue Turtles TV, all that stuff going on. Oh, yep. That was like, they would have like random sections of videos on there. And like, remember that Tent City was randomly one of the videos that would play a lot on like either Blue Torch or Fuel TV. Uh huh. And so, like that. And then the first video I had was uh, Alien Workshop Photosynthesis. It was left on Jason Dill's part. We were just talking about this at, at work today. So somebody came up to me and he's watching Anthony Van England's part. And he was like, this is top five. This is the dude, da, da, da. And we were talking about, so I instantly was like, oh, him and Dill, right? They got uh, FA and uh, hockey. And I was like, Anthony Van England, skater of the year, probably done more shit, but Jason Dill's part in the, uh in that photosynthesis video is maybe one of the top five parts of all time like that part is insane how it starts and like and then it goes in and the song and everything it's really done well yeah just the editing and and the skating and some of his personality like shining through the part is it was i hadn't seen anything like that like directed how they directed the art through everything is this it just blew my mind definitely it caught my attention immediately it was just like what is this and then didn't know all these tricks and things involved or, or, or even a thing and then so it definitely studied that tape a lot i just yeah i couldn't get enough of it say were you aware of any uh other texas skaters like did you know rainy back then and and uh like i don't know any of the austin dudes or like elias or jake no. nunn no i didn't know any skaters really when i lived there because i was so far out and then um i would go to contests just to see what people were up to when i was like 16 i would go driving to houston mm. convince my brother to go to then, and then would see what people were up to and then I, I remember seeing uh Darrell Stanton was like the first pro I saw in person at Southside Skate Park oh sick and and just him having because I think he was back and forth between Long Beach and Texas right and I thought he was from Texas so he was like one of the one of the first ones I was like this dude rolls 
<laughs> that Thrasher cover came out not too, like, in recent time of that, too. Yeah, Clipper at Night. Yeah, the back nose blown at Clipper. Yeah, that was... Insane. We just had yeah, a one of Clipper people. event, and he came out for it. Like, they put the crown on him like he was king for the day. Yeah, I was stoked to see that they, they brought him out, because he definitely... You got to... You got to mention him when you you talk about that spot. Hundred percent. Yeah, I I feel the same way. Well, what was it that drew you out to um, California? You you moved out to San Diego. W- what made you get out there? Uh, it's kind of a long story. Um, I lived in uh, Walker County. Or I lived in Huntsville, which is in Walker County. If you ever heard of Walker County, Texas Ranger. Holy yeah. crap, I remember that. I was in this little town that it was, uh, it was a college town. It was like the first town I moved to when I moved out when I was 16. And um, started working there and, and at this college. But it's, uh, it's just a college, and it's got like four prisons in this one small town. Whoa. And three police departments. And then everybody wants to be Chuck Norris, so it's like a really <laughs> weird place. And um, so I was like living a mile away from work and skating to work. And then got in a, a little bit of trouble where I got caught with like a fingernail piece of weed and got put on probation. And then I was skating to work. It was how I got, got around. Well, it was illegal to skate anywhere in the town. And since I was on probation, I would be going to jail every time I got seen on my skateboard. Whoa. And then, um, so I started running from the cops cause I got tired of going to jail. And I really wasn't going to like stop skating or getting around that way. So I got away from like three or four different cops. And then um, they started figuring out it was the same person that was getting away from them. And that's how the whole Walker County thing ties into it is that everybody thought they were Chuck Norris and took it personal that I was getting away from. So a donut shop I go to every day, they, they were telling me that they're looking for this one skateboarder now. Like they're, I have extra attention trying to find this one guy. And it got to the point where uh, one of them was waiting outside my house, like off duty. It got like really weird and personal thing. Damn. And so I didn't, I didn't leave my house for like uh, five, six days. And I lived with my brother and he started getting like worried for me. Like, Oh man, like kind of worried about your mental state or not. Cause it, he didn't see all the chases and stuff. But I'm just like, yeah, there's this cop that's like randomly waiting outside our house sometimes. Mm. So he eventually got me to go out to eat with him because he was worried about me. And then uh, we went to a barbecue spot. And while we were eating, I got a tap on the shoulder, turned around. It thought maybe it was like a cute girl or something. No, nah, it's, it's a cop. Who sent you? And asked me, are you Chris Scope? Like, no, my name is, he's telling him a different name. And he's like, okay, let's, let me see your ID. I was like, I don't have it. It's in the car. He's like, all right, let's go out to the car and get it. So, like, all right, let's go. I are walking out and I was full of shit. So I just started running once I got enough space. Ran away, got got to the woods and got about a mile and a half to another friend's house. And uh, my brother called me about like, three or four hours later. He figured out, kind of figured where I was. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's what it's like, man. Like, I can't even go out in public without going to jail anymore. So he's like, all right, well, you should probably get out of here, man. This is like, you, you can't be here anymore. So he brought me a backpack. And I went to Houston and bought a Greyhound ticket. And uh, I was going to go to um, Colorado, but to help my friend with like a, a weed operation. Because mm-hmm. it is like, I was like 18. Team didn't really know anything outside of Texas, and uh, that was like my only contact out there. And then a friend convinced me to go to San Diego to try it out for a month because it was winter and going to Colorado is gonna be super cold. So he's like, Yeah, just go to San Diego for a little bit and then go to Colorado if like, like you don't like it. So, um, without talking to somebody or, or talking to the guy or or really know what it looks like or anything off of a friend's suggestion. I took a Greyhound bus to San Diego with 200 bucks. Damn. A little bit over 200 bucks. Hell ride of the century. <laughs> Just ended up um, at um, a friend, Herbie and Jason Barr's house. And uh, just started 
life in San Diego over there at like 19. And that's when living a dream began right there. Wow. So all of a sudden I was just like ripped out of everything I was used to. And I had to go somewhere and I just ended up in San Diego. It's not a bad place to end up though. It's nice weather all year round and beaches and stuff, but like trying to find like income and stuff and like some stabilization must have been difficult. Uh, yeah, just because also because I was from a small town. So being in a bigger city, I had to learn everything and I just didn't know anything. You know, I came in the city as a greenhorn. I like didn't decide to figure everything out and being somewhere where I didn't know anyone was really weird. Mm hmm. And like, yeah, just slowly figured it out, everything out there. Skaters are that way. We'll just figure it out. What, uh, was Washington Street going yet or not yet? It was there. Yeah. Cool. But, um, coming out of Texas, I had never skated transition. Like, I, I just, there was no transition to skate. So I just always skated street. So I like became slowly worked my way into like skating with all the street skaters, or not all, but some street skaters in San Diego. Okay. And getting, working my way into the city that way. So, um, I didn't, I went to Washington street maybe like once or twice, like four years later and after moving there and I uh, couldn't skate there cause it was cause I didn't know how to carve through a pocket or, or carve grind or, or get around the place. Yeah. And that frustrated me that I couldn't skate something. So I started going there all the time. It just like, it pushed me in the opposite direction where it was this, I was like, fuck that. Like, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going places and not be able to skate it. Like that bugs me too much. So I would go in there all the time and it having shade, it was just an easy place to go to like all the time too, like in the summer. Yeah. So it just, yeah, spent a lot of time there after that, just trying to learn how to carve and all that stuff. Was sperm there at the time? Yeah, sperm was. Yeah, he was hauling it down at that time. Sick. Yeah, got a good chunk of sperm time. So, did you kind of learn how to skate like transition at Washington Street? Uh, yeah, between there and Poway, a lot of people were skating Poway skate park at the time. Uh huh. And that was a good kind of stepping stone to Washington Street. Like if. You could learn how to carve around there. You could kind of adapt that to Washington Street a little bit too. Right. So between those two is like, that's where I learned how to carve or, and do most quarter pipe stuff. So who are some of the guys that like you run, you meet early on? Like, do you meet Sam Hits right away? Or like, who are some of the guy, the locals down there that like you kind of like start talking with and they start becoming friends with? Um, Mike Neff, who's huh. like an alder, alder cat there. Um, he's just a really nice dude and fun to skate with. So him and Angelo and, um, uh, Brandon Perlson. Oh, okay. Yeah. Those are kind of like the first people that I met that, uh, made you want to go there a lot. Sick. Yeah. That place is hot. Yeah, I caught the tail end of Washington street being very, you know, like that, that harder, a little bit harder shell to it. Yeah, like in the, I don't think as much now, but back then it, there was like definitely a vibe, right? Like if if you came in wrong and you were kind of like vibed out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get thrown, you can get stuff thrown at you, or like someone call you out, or yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. The, the the OGs were still there, and like they're still holding it down like that. Mm hmm. Like, what were some of the first things that you did to make things work out? Like, how are you eating and everything? Like, what well, were you just like super budget or or what? Uh, yeah, the super budget. Um, yeah, not not completely pulling it perfect. Coming in, coming in, <laughs> it was a bumpy landing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I stayed on those dudes' couches for like a month, and then eventually they're just like, well, you know, it's time for you to beat it. We got another guy coming in because you know, I was in like a Midwestern. Everybody there at that house was from Midwest. So they had another Midwest dude coming in. I needed to push out. And they, they, uh, they hooked me up for longer than I expected. So I really appreciative of that. And then, mm -hmm. um, but then, 
And I was just like, yeah, hustling boards. Uh, one one friend worked for a board manufacturer, so he'd bring back like seconds and thirds, and I would sell them for cheap um, to like random people I skated with. And so, like, yeah, at first everything was real minimal. Mm-hmm. Then, like, we'd get odd jobs, and then at one point, like, slept behind a uh, Poncho Vila's a uh, supermarket for a while. Just pushed it up in a bush for some months. <laughs> like, oh, wow. Just to, like, it out. Damn, because no car or nothing, right? Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I showed up at the beginning with 200 bucks, and yeah, no car, no nothing. Okay, did you end so, up getting a job? Yeah, yeah, I would just get random jobs here and there, yeah. Okay. Uh, worked at Worked at a Chinese restaurant, worked at Vons, worked at like all kinds of different places. Mm-hmm. And then um, eventually met a friend, uh, Zach Spain, um, that I would skate with a lot. And he, he hooked me up again to where, a place to stay and like got it to where I could like build myself up to be a contri- contributing member. Let's say uh, somebody's looking to go on a big trip. They don't got a lot of money. What suggestions can you give? What are some tips to like do some traveling on a low budget? Um, I mean, first thing is just only bring a backpack. Bring some kind of soft clothes in there that you can use for a pillow. Mm. And uh, yeah, just meet up with different crews and then try to, I would always use like Flix bus or Mega bus when that was stuff was super cheap back in the day. Right. And then yeah, I would eat at grocery stores every day. Mm-hmm. You know, I wouldn't really go out to eat. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah those, those all of those things will save you some money right off the bat. I remember when I was in high school, a lot of dudes were talking about they would jump onto trains and go from SF to like Portland or Seattle. Like they would somehow just jump onto the train and like be a hobo all all the way up there. And that's how they would get all all the way up to the Northwest. Yeah. The old uh, red and Q-man technique. Yeah. They were doing that too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Yeah. um, I haven't, uh, I haven't really done that much myself. Uh, Yeah. Actually I've never, I've never done it. It's been, um, wanted to try it, but it would never, be sick. yeah, it'd be stuck to just have the experience, but, um, I can't say I, I really know my way around that. Yeah, totally. I, I, you'd want to, you'd want to do it like with somebody that's done it before for your first time, at least to just be like, wait, what is going on? It seems so crazy. Like they just pull over and they're like, what are you doing? In here? You're like, oh. Yeah. I mean, I got a lot of friends that do it and hear the backstories of how like you know the people watching over the yards really chase you down and how like dangerous it really is and uh, uh yeah it's not for the weak at heart that's for sure yeah i mean like in our like in this year right now it seems like there's cameras everywhere like it seems like it wouldn't be as easy as it used to be i could see that being a thing but yeah. uh, i've gotten recent reports people are still pulling pulling that sf to they, they are. Out, that's yeah, sick. So I back that. That's dope. Um, what about like I wanted to talk to you about this wrestling thing. Are you still doing that? No, um, I haven't been doing it since a little bit before COVID. Around before. COVID. Yeah. How did you get uh, hooked up with that? What was the whole deal there? Uh JP Kraus, who owns Herman's Hall in St. Louis. Yeah, we went there. Worked. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, went. He's been working for them for decades, and um, but I knew him from him coming to Washington Street because he's really influenced or he used to live there, and he would do trips back and forth, and that's why Herman's Hole is like it is because it's so influenced by Washington Street. Mm. Uh, but um, he he worked for them, and he invited me out to the skate rock you guys were doing. And I was like, man, I don't, I don't have any money, dude. Like, I can't just be flying there for like this random skate day. Mm-hmm. He was like, well, come on out, and I'll get you like on a couple of days of WWE, and I'll pay for the whole trip. I was like, okay, cool, yeah, I'll totally do that. So I went out there and met up with you guys and skated Harmon's Hole when you guys came through, and then, um, then we worked like three dates after that with WWE. 
So that kind of started that. And then a couple months later, they came to LA and San Diego and I helped them again. And then just asked them, Hey, what's up with jumping on this thing? Like, is there any way I can set my schedule or be able to jump in and off on and off? Cause I don't want to do it like full time. And yeah, they're, they're accommodating to that. So I started helping them all over the place and kind of using the advantage to go and skate to different parts of the country too. So what would you do? Would you help set up or? Yeah, yeah, I was uh, I was just kind of helping set up stuff and um, the front for like the longest time, like kind of catering. Oh, and okay. then I'd slowly work to the back end of the kitchen. Okay, so were you mostly? Are you working at night, and then you have the days free to go skate around? Uh, we would um work from like seven in the morning to like oh shit. And so about like five, somewhere in there, like five to seven, somewhere in there. And then um, then you had the rest of the night to skate. And we'd always be at a stadium uh, living on the tour buses. So we just like, instead of hanging on the tour bus, you would just go skate the downtowns yeah. and go check out, like, go to go to different skate shops and like check out the local spots and just kind of find out what's going on. And we did like three different cities a week with them. So... Would like you, every week for, for years. Would you like, did you mix with the wrestlers? Would you see them and talk with, like, did you get to know any of them? Yeah. Some of them were like, Oh, just friendly people. I like, just got to know everyone on the crew. You know, I would know those people, but I never went out of my way to like talk to anyone uh -huh. or get, you know, so the people that were open to it would just like, come back and like bullshit with all the, chefs and stuff and you got to meet them and they're like big show is super cool uh ray mysterio jr is super cool yeah the super down to earth people with good sense of humor so we drink beer with the big show the yeah, big show rules well it's a big show Man, big show is <laughs> sick <laughs> yeah, he's got such a good sense of humor and like it was refreshing and i always I always thought that thought of him as Captain Insano <laughs> from Waterboy. Yeah. You know, everyone else is like, oh, it's Big Show, you know, the wrestler. I'm like, no, dude, this Captain Insano, <laughs> dude, that rules. <laughs> dude, me and my brother grew up on wrestling. Like, we loved that shit when we were younger. And then, like, when we were getting older, we started figuring out where they would stay. So we would go to the hotel afterwards. And then, like, one night, it was just a jackpot. Like, there was Ric Flair, Big Show, I think Hulk Hogan was even there. There's just like a bunch of people drinking and mm -hmm. we went to the bar, got a beer. And then we ended up sitting next to the big show was like at the bar too. And he was super cool. And we were just talking, I don't even know about what, but all of a sudden he's like, Hey man, we're going to Sacramento tomorrow. If you guys want to trek up there, I'll put you on the list. And we're like, what? Like, it was so right. cool. He was like the coolest dude ever. It was insane. Yeah, he's so down there, it's, man. Yeah, it's really back that guy. He rolls. Huh. But that's how they rolled, yeah. I mean, they would just roll to different places after. And it was, they're kind of on a rolling party all, all over the place. They, they party hard, right? And, yeah, yeah, they're entertaining groups of people. <laughs> <laughs> Was yeah. there ever any like hijinks where it was like anything happened? I remember one time, I think Barry Windham got in a fight in the elevator with somebody or something. Some crazy. I forget. It was a long time ago, but it was like those dudes would get wasted. Oh yeah, I mean, I I only saw like a little bit. You know, those. It it's not like I was always hanging out with those guys or in that circle so much. But like we we didn't had a good friend that was part of our crew that was friends with those guys, so we would end up hanging out a decent amount but as far as like that part of the night i think we were already trying to go to sleep because we got to be up the next day mm -hmm. but they didn't have to till 2 p.m right to like get ready for the show so like we're a little bit different schedules and we keep up with them sometimes but it's like really it's impossible <laughs> oh man that's amazing damn that sounds cool though you think you'll go back to it anytime or is it over for you uh, the company that I worked for, they they switched, they lost their contract or whatnot with them 
so they're assigned for a certain amount of years so that catering crew doesn't even work for them anymore so oh, okay yeah that shit that put the sale don't i took advantage of it as long as as long as i could and like yeah i feel like it totally scratched that itch right um i was reading your thrasher interview i think that was a while ago um but it said something about you were really stoked on my childhood friend mr peter culpit pete the ox uh, yes did you ever yeah. get to meet him at that time you said you had never met him no at that time i hadn't met him i was just a big fan of anything you could see of him just every time you saw him it was just you couldn't expect what you're about to see type thing <laughs> totally. so it was always like mysterious and new and just like the way he skated was so heavy and like mm -hmm. yeah just yeah still to this day he was like oh it's my, one of my favorite people to watch yeah he was always super inventive and he's just like oh, again that that photo i think luke took of him in japan at uh mikasa where he's like grinding and their shit coming out like that is like it's hard to capture pete but that is that's a great shot of pete and kind of kind of showing people like who this guy is i thought that was one of the better photos of him oh uh, yeah that's that's yeah one of my favorite photos of all time it was speaks so many words in, in that photo so i was thinking about it today and i'm i'm a wordsmith and i i was thinking what if we do a part with you and pete and we call it cope pits what do you think colin <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I got to skate with them. Um, I got to skate with them at Sneak Ditch maybe like two weeks ago. I think. Oh, serious? Yeah, two, three weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, oh, you were up here, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. I was just coming through town. I was just about to fly out to North Carolina. Um, so I was only in town for the the afternoon. But me and uh, Tom Shattuck were about to and uh, Hup were going to the the ditch. And I know he lives over in that area, so I just sent him a random text like just to give it a, a shot in the dark and he ended up showing up. I was stoked to see him. Yeah. He's ripping. Did you get to skate the, uh, the bowl? There's like a little bowl that not, I don't know if many people know about. Yeah. That thing's sick. Yeah. I can't yeah, believe good. they, I can't believe they fucking made that. It's so sick. Yeah. Good job, Jack Vance. Clay. Yeah. You guys killed it. Insane. Um, let's talk about the loop though. When you, you, you were filming that part you did the loop at the in the same part that you did the invert to egg right yes what was the process for that like did you do anything like i've seen where tony hawk they do it at tony hawks and they put the mattresses down and get used to it and <laughs> then they take them out like what what's your steps i'm i'm guessing that's not what you did um no i mean well, I wasn't, this one's not as tall as theirs, too. But, yeah. Uh, I was skating it with uh, Brandon Pearlson. It's like a a full pipe in downtown San Diego. And um, we had just cleaned it out and we were skating around in it. And we were sitting down, just kind of drinking water, looking at it. And then I started thinking that, um, I was like, oh, man, it feels like you could just run it without your skateboard. Like, you could almost kind of fake run it like you could jump at nine o'clock and then do like a fake run around it mm. so i like start messing with that a little bit but it, you know it wasn't doing it as good as i thought i could do it but it it kind of opened the door like it's telling brandon i was like dude we can both just loop this thing and and he's like he disagreed with me and that's what made me really want to do it is that he didn't he didn't think i could or he could uh -huh. and i wanted to I wanted to prove that wrong. So the next day I went back and cleaned it again. And, and, uh, now I went back with Brandon to try to film it and I got smoke thrown down in there. It's super rocky. Like the bottom of the full pipe, I got smoke thrown down and he had something to do. So we just left and then came back another day. It was me and Javi Hernandez and w went and filmed it. And he said he sat there and watched me figure it all out from square one. So he he sat through a long process of just some guy trying to learn how to do this 
on underground, you know, <laughs> like uh-huh. so it was probably a good like two hour two hour ordeal or over ordeal of just figuring it out, learning how to do it. And then once I did it, I was trying to figure out how to do it well. So I ended up doing it like like eight, nine times trying to get like a good one where your hands weren't down and stuff. Uh huh. But yeah, it was a long process of figuring it out. So then you got it, and then did you have to go back and do it when didn't Rhino shoot a photo? Yeah, um, yeah. After that, um, I got his number. I was like, oh, maybe maybe he would actually want to shoot this. So uh, I would see him at Washington Street every so often, but I didn't had I didn't know him like that to hit him up. Uh huh. But I got. I got his number off somebody and just hit him up like, Hey, would you want to shoot a photo like this? And he's like, and then, so we set up a day. <laughs> he, he was, he was down to, so we set up a day. We went back up there and I had to clean the, the dish out again, which is like just cleaning the, the full pipe out. is like an hour or two process of damming it up. Mm-hmm. And he showed up right when I was getting done with that. And then, um, yeah, we shot that photo. Did he ask you what truck trucks you rode when he first met you? Mm, nah, he he's one of those guys. He he's really good at looking. I think you could be like forty feet away and know what kind of trucks you you ride. <laughs> he's got an eagle eye. Oh man, <laughs> me and Rhino have had so many good times. It's fuck that guy's solid, awesome dude. He always let me crash at his place when I would go down there and stuff. And him and Debbie are the best. I love them. Love that guy like a brother. I'd give him a kidney if needed it. Yeah, those uh, are good people right there. What about any other loops? Have you done any other loops since then or tried any? No, like the- not not like that. Um, like ended up doing like reeds part, but it's a little bit different, you know, it's a little bit kind of funnel and then, and then Yeah, and then random but it's bigger, so that one was like it was scary, it had its own elements of being scary. And then mm-hmm. um it's all these little ones that popped up out of nowhere. Um like the this is i think it's been coined like the sheep side type loop the first one i skated was in bream in germany this really? dude matt grabowski yeah matt Gr- grabowski built the first one in germany bremen bremen germany and mm-hmm. then um i went to sheep side when they were just had it they looked like they're going to do a doorway and then i showed them footage of bremen I was like, hey, I've seen this exact size. Like they've they've done this loop before. Or this size loop before. It would fit right here. Uh-huh. I I think the, but then I think Rob Brown might have came in with around the same idea too, uh, afterwards or around the same time. And they ended up building one of those. But it's funny, it ended up being like the sheep side loop is what <laughs> I, I hear a lot of people call it, but it's really came from Bremen, Germany from my uh, minus we're we're trying to get uh josh to let us build one at uh treasure island that was sick <laughs> yeah we got fun, concrete we're ready <laughs> all right sick those you know, things are fun man for sure like it seems sketchy though like maybe it's not the best thing to have it like someplace where like kids could, i don't know uh, he might be a little worried about like the <laughs> liability <laughs> yeah 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 that makes sense did you ever go to Baldy? Have you looked at that? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I went there on the mission. I was a couple of people, but, uh, and uh, I saw. Pretty sure I saw Jaws do a five forty in that thing. <laughs> really? Yeah, he he was either spinning fives or he did a five that day in in Baldy. Yeah, um, but I remember looking at it and just thinking like. Um, like going from the very back and like just walking through and looking at everything and this. It's like, man, the speed kind of is here for someone to loop it, but to loop it is so insane. It's it's so tall to try to do something like that. Yeah, Bob is Bob, Bob is Bob, Bob is Nar. Nar. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally, man. Oh man, that yeah, that was one. Have you thought like if you were given the opportunity, would you try Tony's? He's hit me up before. He invited me to one of those things where he set it up. If it was like a, the right situation, maybe I'd try it, but. During the event, it would just, I don't know if I want to go in front of a bunch of people and risk my life at the same time. Yeah, totally. I get, I get that. <laughs> yeah, I would be nervous to stand in front of people or like minus the loop. 
Have you ever had any like super gnarly injuries? Have you broken bones or any concussions or anything crazy? Uh, probably a mild concussion. Nothing too crazy. I mean, nothing that you know. We all we all get those those scare ones. But um, I have tore my ACL. Had a oh. um, surgery on my ACL. Tore it in half. And and then um, also had broke my ankle and I got four screws and a plate in my ankle. Uh huh. So those are the main injuries. Hey, I want to introduce you to Magic Mind, a once a day shot that can go along with your coffee to increase your focus dramatically, reduce stress, and give you added energy that isn't an up and down caffeine feel, but more of a constant all day vibe. It contains matcha, add pathogens, no autropics, and more. I don't really even know what those things are, but I know that they help. So for me personally, I have a hard time reading anything that is longer than two paragraphs without my mind taking a wander down distraction street and uh, whatever else is going on. I just started taking this to see if that will help me and also my daily work focus to help increase productivity. Who knows? I might even start another podcast. I got myself a case and have started my daily intake and you can too. Go to magicmind.com forward slash S-C-H-M-I-T. That's magicmind.com forward slash Schmidt. If you want to take the journey with me and you can get up to 50% off your first subscription for the next 10 days with my code Schmidt 20. That's S-C-H-M-I-T, the number two, the number zero. Or buy it for a friend or a family member if it's not your thing. Christmas is coming. Everybody needs a gift. If nothing else, your purchases will keep these guys supporting my show. Because we all know this podcast has been free since day one, but it does take work. So let me keep my advertisements by purchasing a first case with our promo and see for yourself if it works. That's magicmind.com forward slash Schmidt and start your journey today. Don't forget the code S-C-H-M-I-T number two zero. What about SF? You spent some time up here. What was some of the, what was some of the highlights? Yeah, yeah, I would pop in and SF has always been on the trail. I've been living like three hours north of SF. Mm. And so it's the closest big city to go skate. And then just having people I want to skate with there, reasons to kind of go down south there for like two, three days and skate. Where's three hours north Mendocino or something up there, Humboldt? Yeah, uh, Covalo. Okay. Huh. Kind of way out in the pits. Um, You got any P-Stone stories? All right, I'm ready for you, uh, bud. <laughs> the first one that comes to mind is this him we went out to the vert attack in Malmo, uh, Sweden. And there's like the contest day. And then the next day, everybody was just kind of going around. I think they, most of the skaters went to Copenhagen to skate and he stayed behind. And I, I stayed, we both randomly stayed behind and then ran each other at the gas or at the train station. <laughs> and then we just like, decided to just stay in Mamo and skate all day. So we just cruise around hitting street spots. And then we skated the uh, Twizzler Park and then um, and then just cruise around the rest of the night and met up with the crew later. But that whole day, he had a red wig, <laughs> like a bright red wig. Yeah. <laughs> now we got fire. Yeah, he's in a bright red wig and a, um, a SF Giant Snuggie. So his outfit was all crazy, and but we cruise around different skate spots, and then you'd take off the snuggie or the the wig, and then I uh, get some tricks, and like then we just hit another spot, and then we ended up skating the skate park, and then we're cruising through downtown, and we're kind of pushing fast through the park or the city, and I just look over, and it says him in this bright red wig, <laughs> and, and the snuggie, and you're like, man, this guy is such a character, but then when we go to like a bar for like a drink like a quick beer or something and like nobody would look at him weird for wearing what he's wearing. I feel like if me or anybody else were wearing that, we wouldn't have the charisma to not 
for it to be normal. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like, you could wear anything like that, and people are just like, oh, I was just not paid any mind. I just thought that was really interesting is that he just could blend in so well that you could just wear anything like that and nobody would bat an eye. Good times right there. I don't know if that was the trip or not, but there was one trip where he, because me and him got the Snuggies together um, the night before we went on Skate Rock. We got the Snuggies and then we bought Jake this uh, hat. It was a panda hat. And then Jake's head got smashed the first night and blood went all over the white panda hat. But I heard I wasn't on the trip later. Preston went on a trip. It might have been that one where I heard he never got out of the Snuggie. He wore the Snuggie the entire trip. Are you out of your mind? Dude, he's running it tough that trip. I don't know if it's the same one, but he was definitely running it tough. <laughs> Holy shit. Fucking miss that dude. It was the best. That was, man. His whole antics were always like he, the thing about him too, I'm sure you probably witnessed this was that you'd be in a random place and he would know where to get like hot dogs or something. He'd be like, oh, right around the corner, best tacos in town or something. Like he would just know some random fact about anywhere that you were. He's like, oh yeah, there was a little thing there. And you'd be like, how the fuck do you know that shit? Well-traveled person. And I mean, I heard stories of him Going, it was either college or late high school or something in Europe. Yeah, so he's been was bouncing back between for, a long for the longest time. time. Yeah, yeah, long time. So there's yeah. a lot of chances for no around the corner. Yeah. Uh, Rhino told me to ask you about getting your iPhone stolen multiple times. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Um <laughs> <laughs> You've gotten yeah, your phone uh, stolen multiple times? Yeah, I guess I tend to be careless with it sometimes or something. Um, all right, one one was um, uh, at EMB. I was I went I went to at Pier Seven and uh, Dennis Business and Mark Susu were skating there, and I was like, okay, I'm not gonna skate here right now because they're killing it way too hard. So I'm gonna go over to EMB and kind of mix it up. Like I'm just get in some skating because I had just getting back into town. I didn't skate for like a week and uh, I get over to EMB and it's Reynolds and the Baker crew is over there. Oh shit. And you're like, Oh man. Okay. That, that was good. Second luck. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but I, I just put my phone kind of and a couple other things down, like kind of like maybe 20, 30 feet away from them where it's kind of near their stuff where mm -hmm. it kind of be like no one would jack it, but also not with them, you know? I was just kind of skating, doing my, my own thing, just trying to, like, cruise around and, like, warm up my legs because it had been a while. And I uh, go back to check my phone, and it's gone. I was like, okay, here we go. So I'm, like, I'm like starting to, like, keep track of all the people that are around that zone. You know, there's a bunch of lurkers in that zone. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm, like, cruising everywhere, trying to see if someone had it. Couldn't find it. Went back to my car. I had a second phone because where I live, you need two phones because uh, just like weird service areas. Mm -hmm. So I went by my other phone to track that one. I went by uh, Andrew. And I, I, just, I was just like, hey, what's up, man? I'm just letting you know that I'm just trying to find my phone. Like, I'm not just like walking around this place all crazy, you know, because uh, <laughs> like I helped build it. I helped build one of his uh, a mini ramp and he started a while back. So I had met him before. Oh, okay. That concrete one in his yard that he uh -huh. had at one point. And I was like, yeah, dude, I'm just looking for my phone. I'm not just walking around all, all over e EMB now. And uh, he's like, oh, man, I was just trying to help someone get their phone back the other day. Like, you might as well just let it go, man. Like, I was like, ah, no, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. I got footage of, like, Simon and Livy and all these dudes on it. Like, I, gotta, I have to go find it. Mm -hmm. And so I started tracking it. And the guy was like taking the battery in and out, so it like wouldn't be able to be tracked, uh -huh. and then it'd be tra be able to be tracked. But he made like a dot, like path. So I like in it took like two or three hours at this point, and I'm in the like the tenderloin. And but he made a path to where I could get in front of the path, and so next time he turned the phone on, I would be right next to him or within near him. Uh huh. 
And so uh, the next time he turned his phone on, I ended up like a block away from him. So I skated over there and then saw him with his hand or saw him with the phone like in the street light about to take the SIM card out. And I went over there and just grabbed it out of his or tried to grab it out of his hands. So we ended up just locking up, ended up being this whole thing. And I ended up getting away with it. And uh, the, one of the first things I did, I sent Andrea a clip of Simon. I was like, dude, got it. <laughs> Sick. Wow, that's amazing. Fuck yeah, dude. Yeah, that, that was one of them I, I, that I think he's referring to. And the other one is um, um, I lost one in downtown San Diego and it ended up being in Skid Row down there. And so I was like going around in Skid Row around like seven in the morning trying to locate it. Because again, just put it to all my friends that I wanted to get back because I like hardly back stuff up. Yep. And um, so I'm going around trying to find it. And I've it's at this recycling place. And I know it's in there. And I know one of the three dudes that are working there have it. Like someone just sold it to him for cheap, you know? And mm-hmm. they're about to run it down to Mexico and get a little bit more for it. And so, like, I go in there and, like, um, try to um, talk to the guys. Like, hey, let me, I know, like, the phone's sitting around. Like, one of you guys probably got it. And, like, no worries, like, how you got it. Like, no big deal. But just let me buy it off of you. And they weren't having it. And um, I wasn't really not big enough to intimidate anyone, <laughs> especially three people. And so I called him for some backup. I was like, hey, <laughs> Rhino, come help me reason with these dudes, man. Like, I'm just not big enough to really get through these guys, you know. Not not to go in and, like, cause trouble, but just to be like, hey, just take the situation serious. Like, I'm just really trying to buy it back. And, like, so Rhino came and helped me out and uh, ended up turning this thing where, like, I was trying to find it, couldn't find it because I knew they had it and then um, ended up not being able to get it back and it just ended up being this long mission for both of us. But yeah, thanks for helping me out with that right now. I was, it sucks to be, uh, went for the mission, didn't, didn't come up with the phone at the end of it, but it was my fault for losing. So you have two phones and one phone has the other phones tracking. So if you lose one, you can get, you can find it. Yeah, I mean, if you you can track your phone from any phone, really, you know. Uh, but I had to have have two phones, so Got I it. didn't need to use somebody else's phone. Because mm-hmm. where I live is so out of the middle of nowhere that the only phone service that works is U.S. Cellular. Right. But also, that phone company doesn't work mostly any other place in the U.S. Uh huh. It only works in like really random zones, so I have to have two phones. Oh, got it. Okay. Who are you getting bored from? Uh, uh, Frank and Pete and Julian been giving me boards over at uh, Grimple Sticks. Oh, you ride Grimple Sticks? That's what they give me. I've been hyped to get boards for them. Huh. You get yeah, Spitfires like, too? Yeah. Okay. And then yeah. Rhino hooks you up with trucks probably? Got Indies? Yeah. Hooks up the tracks. What size in- what trucks have you got? uh 159s do you ride a smaller board or a wider board um i like it eight and a half is what i've been riding recently but there's been points where i ride a shape board that kind of hangs over a little bit mm. but um, for like maybe the last couple of years i've been riding like just a popsicle eight and a half it seems to work good does that fuck with you a little bit when you can't see the wheels if the board's wider than the wheels like you look down and you don't see wheels does that fuck with you yeah, a little bit. I like to I see like at least more. the edges. Like, I, I need to see a little. Yeah, yeah. You want, yeah, you want to see a barely a little bit of it, but I don't. I don't want to be able to like see too much of it. I don't want a hot no. dog. That's yeah. for sure. I'd rather go. I'd rather. I'd, I'd rather go hoverboard than hot dog. Yeah, for sure. Um, what's up with the wheel wells? You're making custom wheel wells. Uh, yeah, I just made some uh, when I was riding bigger wheels. I was riding like 58s and 60s a lot for a while. Mm. And so you just need it because I didn't like riding riser pads. I like to be as low as I could and, mm-hmm. and um, still ride bigger wheels. So 
the logical at that point was just to make wheel wells. So I just started making wheel wells in my board. And once you do that once or twice, you can't go back. It's you get used to it. And even if you ride smaller wheels, you still want wheel wells and all that. Mm. Yeah, I can't do riser pads unless it's a cruiser board. Yeah, at that point it makes sense. But other than that, I want to be as low as I can for mm. just board feel and all that. You got a staple when you come to San Francisco? Do you got like a Mexican, like a taco burrito place you go to or anything that's like your favorite? You got anything that you're attached to in the city? Preston used to tell me every time he goes to Santa Cruz, he can't go there without going to Derby. So he would go straight to Derby every time he went to Santa Cruz, take a run. And then he's like, okay, now I can okay, do whatever I, I got to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, nothing I have to do before I even start. But I mean, Potrero ends up being a. Yeah. Like that place is so fun to skate. And, and just the people that worked on it, Peter Gunn worked on that park, you know, a mm. sick crew worked on the park. So. Uh, danger there's multiple reasons to like that park and it's just right super good yeah mm. and um as far as food and stuff i don't know like i think it just ended up at a el matate right down the road just because it's the easy hit right after potrero that's a good one we we would go to el matate a lot at lunchtime we would drive all the way over there because they got good uh shrimp like, I don't know what they do with it, but they saute it up. Get a shrimp taco, shrimp burrito. Those ones are good. I, we got to talk about the, um, what, what do they call it? I don't know what they call it, but it's the indie ditch race thingy that just happened. Yeah, that was, that was a cool event, man. And this year was really, every year has been fun, but this year is really fun. Tell me about the pipe. Like you entered the thing through the pipe and then I heard like later they were having races or something down it. Like how did that all evolve had that happened before or were you looking at it and thought like i'll try this or like what happened no i've been we've been skating i personally have been skating there for like over 10 years but i've never looked at it because the the ditch has so many options and it's so entertaining in itself they don't really pay attention to the surroundings as much because there's already so much entertainment there you know like you don't you're not like sitting around bored like oh what do we do now it's like there's plenty of things to do there so um and we this is the first time we went i went to help uh the day before and this was just the first time i looked at it and was curious what was up there and then started crawling up there and realized how smooth it was and and then so i army crawled to the top which is like pretty far just to see where it went and see like where the starting point was and saw where it went and then slid back down just like just on my sweatpants and um it's like steep enough to just slide you don't even need to be on the sled or anything you still oh. is that steep whoa how, how so far I, is it about how long like a quarter mile long whoa okay <laughs> yeah it, it's 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 way longer than it looks like in a video <laughs> uh-huh well you're it's, probably it's cooking too. it's right right where the the path starts into walking into the ditch that's where the manhole is like 20 30 feet to your left oh so damn. it's from the top of the street all the way down to the bottom yeah so was that one that you filmed and you come out like in the beginning was that the first time you'd ever done it um uh, we I went down, I slid back down, and then found, Then we went to the top and popped the manhole to be able to just get into it. Me and a friend, uh, Soup, got to it with a um, pry bar and got it open. Mm. And they're like, okay, now we can just get into it from the top. Because the army crawled to the top from the bottom was really took it out. It was like really strenuous. So um, we wanted to just open up the top. And then me and... Um, Luke and Sophia, um, like Rhino's ne nieces and nephew, started sliding down it on beer boxes. No way. And we're just, all three of us were just having fun, like little kids. And then uh, Debbie went down too. And then she was like, I should get a trash can lid because that'll be even faster. So she already was doing an errand and then brought back a trash can lid. And then, uh, uh, Rhino's nephew Luke 
um, went down at first on the trash can lid and shot out the bottom pretty fast, but like was able to stand up and really in control before he got to the ramp because he's about half my size. And he's like, Oh man, that was so fun. Like you try it. <laughs> so, he, so I got the trash can lid. I went to the top. I was like, okay, this will be fun. Like all the other ones were fun before. And then just shot down it. But, uh, Oh yeah. He gave me his phone to see how fast I was going. So when I went down it, I was purposely trying to go fast. So, but when I got to about halfway down, I realized they're building all that shit at the bottom of the, the pipe and I'm going too fast to slow down. Like I'm going to run into everything in the bottom. <laughs> so, so like, yeah, in the middle, I just like the math was going off my head. Like, Oh, this is not good. This is not good. Yeah. I ended up running in that ramp. So that was why it was like so unexpected and odd looking is because like, yeah, I didn't expect to just shoot out of that pipe going that fast. I've never been down there. I want to, I want to go next year for sure. It looks every time the highlights and everything just look like carnage and just so it looks sick. It looks like a good event. Yeah. It's super fun. And, and the, the ditch is just a good spot in general to just go okay. check out like Tony Hawk and, Jeremy Klein had been skating that ditch for like a decades upon, you know, and, uh, probably almost three decades. Oh, okay. So it's like got so, history. Yeah, it's got some history. Definitely come check out the, the race next year. It's, 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 it's intense. So do you know the history of this thing? Like how long has it been going and how it all started and everything? Um, the first one was probably about like seven, eight years ago and Matt Swanigan had the idea for it and he kind of went down there and fixed the ditch and had the idea to do like an invitational thing, like a real low key type of deal and just invite people that are like the local crew, like the Dago dogs in San Diego and then also dudes that could bomb hills. So we and he had just asked me to help kind of organize a little bit that part. Like the whole idea was his, but he just helped me, told me to like kind of help him organize the whole thing. So I just went down there and kind of helped him like clean the thing out and then like kind of invited certain people. And, uh, you know, he had all the like local crew and then I invited like, like Hits and Hewitt to come check it out. And then, um, and Rhino. And so like they came and checked it out. And then after, that one then um like the footage came out and kill skateboarding three one of hits his videos and i think rhino saw that and was like oh man there's potential here and then wanted to organize the next one which didn't happen again for another like three or four years i believe mm. and then um and then he's he's taken the reins of it and done like a great job with it and mm. it's really awesome that uh they're doing such a good job with it and still like involving uh matt's name in it uh which is mad dog is one of his nicknames and so that's it's cool that they're still like honoring that and keeping him a part of it yeah you got it right he he's like local dude from san diego like lifer down there yeah yeah he, he's a really interesting character he like um like he would build a lot of DIYs um maybe like 15 over 15 years ago like all over the ditches and stuff in San Diego and him and like a couple of his friends would take like concrete bags on the trolleys and yeah. like go and pour stuff kind of kind of pre like anyone else I remember really doing that I mean there was like the Washington Street dudes would every once in a while like do something in the ditch here and there but he got a lot of spots going like there's like the lemon grove ditch has a like a five foot quarter pipe in it but it's also a good dish that has transition at the bottom so it's like a it's been a famous spot for a long time but him and his little crew built that quarter pipe and a bunch of other things right. and i don't think a lot of people like ever knew who actually built it but that was like him and his 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 little crew mm. But yeah, he's, he's, he's kind of a fixture in the whole, uh, San Diego story. Definitely. Rad, man. Did something happen to him recently? Um, yeah, he, uh, I would say 
four years ago. Yeah, I want to say four, about four years ago, he um, got in an accident with a train and had to have all oh, these immediate surgeries done on him. Whoa. And, uh, yeah, I was happened to be in Seattle when it happened. And so, like, me and Lucas and all his friends, like, went to see him, and he was just in very critical condition. And He got hit by a train? And only a, a guy, yes. And, like, only a guy tough as him would have, like, made it back to where he has. Like, he's just the toughest guy. And so now he's, like, s- still rehabbing everything and, like, developing as all his um, functions back. And, um, yeah, just the, one of the only guys I can think of that can actually make it through something like that. Mm. Like, the whole, like, kind of almost, like, cards thing where, like, someone told him that, none of this is ever going to work again. And he just fought through it all. And now he's like getting around and communicating, still doing rad art. He was like a big fixture in like graffiti up and down the coast. So if you're a graffiti guy and you talk to him, ask him like a graffiti guy in Portland or Seattle or SF or San Diego or LA, like everyone knows this dude. Like he's, he's a big fixture in that too. Okay. So and he's still doing a really rad art and stuff too. So Damn, that's heavy, man. Fucking get hit yeah. by a train is no joke. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone ever really got the real story of like how it happened or what happened, but mm-hmm. that was, that was the story we got. It was a train, and they had to do like a rigorous surgery on his, on his spine, his pelvis, oh, his, 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 his skull, like everything. It was oh, just wow. like he got me, and. Yeah, it's like super heavy duty accident. Hey, today he's like you know smiling, doing art, right and able to get around. Has he shown up at any of those recent, uh, the recent ones? No, we need to get him back down there. He's in a wheelchair, but um, so it might be a little bit complicated again down there. No, getting okay. him down there, it's, it's possible. Like that was kind of the goal last one and this one but like i showed up like the day before so kind of trying to organize everything was kind of like last minute as far as that goes but yeah definitely next year we need to have him down there and like he'd be stoked to see it all going down because he's like a really insane hill bomber too like he like he was flying down that ditch the first the first invitational thing so like he Obviously, he's super into hill bombing. If he was to have something like that go on and be so motivated to make something like that happen, right? Damn, it's a bummer, man. That sucks to hear. Turns out to be a huge inspirational story just to see what he's he's gone through and like fought through. Just yeah, get on. The tough guy. Those are the rad ones, right? When somebody tells you you can't do it, it makes you want to do it more. And and sometimes that helps with the healing process or the mind power to get through these critical stages and stuff. It's a, kind of a miracle sometimes when you think of it. You're just like how like this like you said th- this wouldn't happen with many other people besides this type of dude. Yeah, it it, it would take that character to make it out of it, and I let yeah someone telling you not that you can't do something is a huge motivator too. I, I kind of work that way. It's like, I'd be more motivated to do something. Someone said I, I couldn't do more than like, Oh, you got that. It's like, there's more motivation in me, like proving it wrong than, than the opposite. That probably is something with those guys that like get faced with something like that. They're just like, well, fuck, fuck that. Like I'm, I'm coming back. You're not going to tell me like what I am. So do they do it? like one against one or do they do just like a whole how, how does it work four at a time four at a time so there's four four at a time and, and yeah you just you have a certain amount of space to run and throw down uh you're supposed to have your board down at a, at a certain point and then you can push all you want or do whatever you want from there like use whatever technique you want to get to the bottom uh-huh. and uh yeah just with four people in there it gets it gets hectic Who's the one, I mean, there was a bunch of people, but one dude, I saw a lot of footage of this one guy just really eating shit. He like went up onto the bank and he slipped, like he almost flipped or like. Yeah, I, 
I didn't know everyone at the event. And it seemed a lot of people that were getting smoked were people we didn't really know. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah. I mean, is it kind of like a, a lot a word gets around? It's not just a tight crew. It's like anyone can go. Well, yeah, it's the very first one. We kept it very invitational. Only the people that knew about it would show up for the most, you know, for the okay. most part. And, and then it kind of grew a little bit more and more every time we did it and there's more notice of like oh this is happening so people were you get more a little bit more wild card of a crew in there when you do it that way you know mm -hmm. and you saw the results of that you know people dude it's people get smacked <laughs> just like that one in uh was it finland or whatever a while ago was like dude like man people are just getting smoked Oh yeah, the one on the grass hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah that one. That one looks fun. That looks like a fun event. Uh -huh, like that, with Mar Marius at the helm, I'm sure that's a a great event. Absolutely. Hey, I was gonna ask you too. Um, in the invert world, like, who are some of the guys? Because I know you got mean inverts too. Like, who do you look at? Like, oh man, he's coming. Like, I can't wait to skate with this dude. Like, who are some of the dudes that you get hyped on? I, yeah, I mean, the first three I would think of is like, yeah, when Kowski's holds the crown, like there's, a, there's, I don't think there's anyone that's ever really been able to do stuff that he does and like this, the strengths that he has and natural ability to just hold himself upside down is, I think, unrivaled. And then uh, Jesse Linlaw and uh, Keenan. Huh. And in Witty is an insane upside down guy. Yeah. I, I get uh, inspired off those guys. Um, uh, Simon, dude, Simon Bannero has got some insane inverts. I think you might forget about it every once in a while because he's so good at everything. That, <laughs> but he's his eggplants are insane. He's got great style. Yeah. And then, you know, yeah, I like watching the powerfulness of russell and and sandoval like oh, that's red too um but personally is like watching eric develop at an early stage was super inspirational because we would i was kind of around for when he was all learning all that stuff because he's like an insane street skater yeah and then just started learning uh vert tricks like daily and then all of a sudden he was just like oh that's all of a sudden like that's how you want to do it like how this this dude's doing it yeah i got to witness him early on because cranny kind of saw him and uh got him on oj and this is before he was even on santa cruz and he he came down to the bay area and would yeah. skate with me and cranny and and cranny's just like watch this he'll do every fucking like skating a mini ramp and he could do inverts like he's on a vert ramp and just like wow yeah because he, he learned all that stuff his local park has a three and a half foot uh mini ramp that's not especially steep uh. and he learned front side birds eggplants like all all these tricks are like impossible to do all, close to impossible to do on a mini ramp huh. uh he learned he learned 540s on that ramp he learned like everything on a three and a half foot mini ramp so like dude he kind of just rewrote how you even learn all that stuff it's yeah he's pretty he's, nice. he's definitely like uh you know he's taken a lot of things and made them his own and he's his unique he's got his unique stamp on skateboarding like like you said you wouldn't if you didn't know you might not believe it but he's doing big rails and stairs and everything in the street and like that was kind of how we saw him I, I forget the name of the video but he had a full part in this video maybe it was a seattle video or something but uh mm -hmm. way way before you know and he he rail slid this long ass rail and it was at night or something i'm pretty sure and uh so yeah like just all that and he's right in this crazy size board shaped and like sometimes no nose chopped or whatever it's just like ripping yeah yeah i mean he's got a heavy background with all that stuff i mean like he was 
I think around like 14, 15, there was like footage of him lip sliding a 20 stair rail. <laughs> yeah. And so like he, every, at 14 or 15, you know, cause everyone in his, his friend group was older than him. He was the little guy. Oh, okay. So, so he was like, always like keeping up with dudes like three or four years older than him as a younger dude. And then, uh, yeah, don't forget he like nolly flipped triple sets and like all this crazy stuff before <laughs> he even got it, even before he mastered all this other stuff. So like, mm. yeah, there's like, this whole other skill level or skill set. I don't people don't see as much that he's still sitting on. Right. And if, if we're gonna talk about inverts too, I gotta bring up Red. Red has my favorite invert. Uh. Mark Red Scott. Yeah, this powerful. And but he got an Andrix, right? Yeah, he does Andrex too. He does all Garials. He does you know all kinds of them. But uh, the the double hip hop, the double oh, yeah. invert or hip hop, however you want to call it. It's like, yeah, that comes from Red, and it's just like I just like how he does all his inverts. Like he's, it's just powerful and like just manly and just getting it done. Is this? Yeah, that's my favorite invert. No sugar to it. It's just straight, just raw invert. <laughs> it's just so rad. It's always a pleasure getting to watch Red skate or skating with him. Like he took us on a couple little missions when we were up that way. Like he introduced us to, I don't know if you ever skated him, but they called them the ship banks where it was like, uh, there was a wall in between like different categories and it was like a oververt and you could like ride up and go over the wall into the other one. I don't think I've been in that, that one. I think it would be between Eugene and Portland somewhere like, cause we were in that area, but I don't, okay. it's probably a small town somewhere there, but he took us there. It was so sick. Like just like having to take the train, you had to like walk down this tracks, like all the way out in the, and we were like this, cause we weren't, we didn't know. And we're just like, is what, what's he doing? Is he fucking with us or is he taking us to a spot? And then sure enough, we get to this <laughs> spot. And it was like, all right. <laughs> all yeah. right. That sounds like a fun adventure. I mean, cause he's from out in the outskirts of that zone. So I'm sure he knows all these little weird mm. things and all those small port or Oregon towns. For sure. Thinking about like your whole life, once you started getting into skateboarding and then moving out, from you know to the west coast and stuff do you have like a laundry list of like people that have helped you along the way like do you have like some people you really want to thank you that helped you in a bind some sponsors anything like that that like you want to give a shout out to before we you know end the thing um uh, yeah a lot of people helped me out as i was figuring everything out um just getting pushed into california i did had there's a lot of people that helped me along the way. I would say uh, I'd like to thank Hervey Haskins, uh, Zach Spain, um, Gabe Benovich, uh, Danny Bogle, and Matt Owen at Route 44. Route 44 has kind of like been a huge guide of what I appreciated in skateboarding. They they kind of opened my eyes to a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh Kenny Grant and Keen Lou. Um, uh, Ry Clancy. Uh, made a shout out to Matt Swan again for popping off the whole race. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just everyone that's helped me out to this day. Uh, Rhino has been a huge part of keeping me hyped and like kind of this huge inspiration to everything and how he's been a part of opening up skateboarding to everyone's eyes is like, yeah, huge thing to him. Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there'd be one or two to forget, but that seems to cover you, for now. <laughs> you mentioned that you got some, you get stuff from Frankie, right? Grimple sticks or something. Yeah. And, and then what wheels do you get? Do you get spits? Uh, yeah, Spitfire wheels, and then um, get independent tracks and Brunson bearings, and then Route 44 skate shop, and then uh, Banger Management, Wes's company. Shout out. Today's Wes's birthday, actually. I know. That's so sick. <laughs> <laughs> Happy yeah, birthday, yeah. Wes. Yeah, Wes helped me out a lot, too. So, yeah, shout out to that dude. That dude's a 
obvious legend. You yeah, can see well, that from across the country. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'm trying to uh I think we're gonna start two thousand twenty four first episode. Wes Kramer, he heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. Just talked to him the other awesome. day and he was yeah. like, Yeah, let's do it, Hemi. <laughs> Rad. Yeah, I've been stoked to hear that one, man. He, he's been traveling a lot lately, so there's been. I'd be stoked to hear some of the some of the stories he's came across recently. Like he was just in Europe for like four months, or three, yeah. a little bit over three months, like as long as you stay. And right. And it, yeah, right now he's in Mexico. Like I just barely got to see him during the race, but oh, I'm okay. sure he's got like all kinds of travels to to talk about. Yeah, he was on that Thrasher vacation trip in Canada. It looked like the best crew ever. It looked so good. I was bummed. I was like, damn, that yeah, was... It looked like, yeah, it looked like a good crew going on and on real solid. Um, do you put any thought into Skater of the Year? Do you think about it? Do you care? Like, are you in tune with, like, who's ripping? Do you Do you want somebody? Do you think somebody should do it? Or is that... What are your views on that? I mean, there's like people that like I I see I want to happen it it happen for, but then I like I don't really pay attention much to it until you you know the magazine starts talking about it's like oh yeah that's a thing and what do I remember from this year type deal. Um, personally, I like every year it's like like you think Grant could win it every year, and then like <laughs> Simon Benro is like. If you if you skate with Simon recently, you're just like this is who I think it should be is Simon. Uh. But um, as far as like what you actually put out that year and all that stuff, then you start like um, calculating all that stuff and then putting that into the actual decision because that's what it really comes down to. Yeah. Um. Yeah, like I usually have to be reminded what happened in the year more than like keep track of it through the year personally. I want to. I just wanted to say Evan Evan Smith got robbed one year. Yeah, he absolutely destroyed it the year. He was like super in the running for it, like like just like three or four covers. Yeah. It was like the year he did the kickflip over the rail to the brick wall ride. Mm. And, and he, yeah, I think he had like three covers, couple parts, and just like if you skated with him that year, he was just on fire. One of the nicest dudes you could ever meet. Just very genuinely yeah. unique human being. He's um, yeah, Evans is sick too. He has his definite another guy that has his stamp. Like you, he skates his way. Yeah, I feel like he really like opened up how we looked at skateboarding that year. I mean, that kick up over the rail to the wall ride was just something different. And then he was doing 540s off, off jumps, like, or jump ramps all of a sudden. And then, like... Yeah, I think he was MVP a King of the Road. Yeah, exactly. That was the year he got MVP He was King MVP of King of the Road, of like, the road like, and he oh, had a cover on the Bay Bridge. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, like, so many things are just, like... Yeah, you kind of won it that year. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it, it just goes back to, you know, skateboarding is... It is gnarly as hell, and it's it hasn't flatlined. Everybody thought, like, oh, it can't get any gnarlier, and it just continues to. I mean, the shit Pe Pedro Delfino's yeah. doing is bonkers. Like, you just see so many people ripping, and it's hard to... You know, it's like a lot of different styles and a lot of different techniques and everything. And it's like, holy shit, man. It's it's amazing that it just keeps going. Like, it's crazy to me that, like, the mag is as thick as it's ever been. There's hardly any magazines in life anymore. But Thrasher is this thick mag that people still gravitate to every month. It it says a lot about our culture, you know? Like, it's, it's really become this thing that's like bigger than anything it's like it's it's a way of life it's just it is this thing that we're all so lucky to be a part of yeah really really stoked that it's still in print and hopefully it continues to be in like to outlast like some of these major magazines like rolling stone and stuff like that like it's yeah. such a testament to the following and what it means to everybody and it's a cool thing to help keep me connected to this thing that we love so yeah major well i always ask people uh 
this question and it's not easy. So it doesn't have to be the number one thing, but I always like to hear one thing that sticks out to you that you've seen someone do on a skateboard. Like you were there for like something pretty gnarly or like, you know, like, I don't know what it would be, but, um, you know, Strubin said it was when Brian Schaefer did the loop and fucking ate shit. He was like, fuck. And then other people yeah. said, I've, I've seen the gnarliest trick go down or whatever. But like, I'm sure you've seen some crazy shit at Washington Street, but like anything stick out to you? Um, yeah, it'd be hard to go with just one, but one of the first things that comes to mind is Sean Ross, front side invert over the channel at Washington Street. Because mm. he the right side he's goofy and the right side is bigger than the side he's going to. <laughs> and he was still going off the coping. Like he wasn't coming off like in the middle of the channel. He was like going off the coping and flying down to his arm. And that channel doesn't even really line up. So, and uh, all the tries before he made it where it looked like he was going to get so hurt. Like he's doing spider monkey stuff to get out of it, and uh, yeah, to see him make make the one and just who he is and his character too. Yeah, that was yeah, that, that dude's a good. maniac. He's sick. Yeah, he's ball energy, man. He's he's entertaining. <laughs> um, that's one of the first ones that comes up to mind. Okay, that's a good one. I heard, I think maybe it was in that interview, you said, did Ronnie Sandoval do front side air to disaster on the oververt? He, yeah, he was trying it. And at first, it was like, you just kind of laugh. You're like, dude, that's, oh, what, why, are you, why are you throwing that up there? Dude, that's not, that's not going to work. Doubt you know? Ronnie. You're just thinking, <laughs> dude, that's, that's never going to work. And then he started like, disastering and like rolling down the wall a little bit and belling you're just like oh shit he can actually do that that is fucking crazy <laughs> like yeah it just like expanded my hey, what I thought of physics immediately just like I didn't think that was even close to a thing that you could do have you ever stood on his skateboard his yeah yeah he rides loose tracks yeah it's uh there's it seems so like a lot of a lot of the channel guys got that thing going on. Dude, they're not loose. They're like, they're like, there's no bushings loose. Like one time I was uh, filming a contest he was at and I didn't have my board with me. I was like, Hey, can I borrow your board? I'm going to do a little follow thing. And he's like, <laughs> you can't ride my board. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, here, try to ride my board. And I stood up and I was like, what the fuck? Like, it's just like, wow, like, insane and so yeah. my point being is like how the hell does he skate vert and all this shit with this trucks that loose it's amazing yeah i can see it somehow coming in advantage in like smaller steeper stuff but then if you're skating like a vert ramp or something huge mm. there's not much benefit going on there it's like it's only going to be way harder to like keep speed and, and and like not wobble out of things like yeah i mean yeah, it's so insane. Sick. Rombo. Have you been going up to uh, Pedro at all since it's been going again? Uh, no, I haven't been there since it opened again. I just oh, want okay. to go back and check it out. What is yeah, your is what's your favorite spot um, from San Diego? Let's say you're going to San Diego to Portland. What is one spot you're definitely hitting? There's this thing I live pretty close to now. Uh, this guy, Thomas Martinson has built this thing in his yard and it's it's pretty close to the size of a skate park but he built it four feet at a time by himself wow and so it's it's like a, a pinball course so it's like nothing's over four feet but it's very challenging and like hard or fun and and hard to get around like everything's just mashed together mm. And so it's a really fun, rad thing to figure out. And he's a super rad dude. And if you get anyone ever in that area, hit him up, man. Rad character. Oh, Second yeah. for everything to skate. Grindline the band. You know the music? Yes. You got a favorite song? 
Um, it doesn't even have to be a favorite, but w- one we could put on for the end of this thing. <laughs> the first ones that come to mind are the ones that have skate videos to it already, like um, with, like Broken Bottles and I'm a Creep, like those. But I don't really know the names of songs in most of them, but I've seen them play like a lot. Like remember a lot of the songs, but just not the names of them. So I've like heard them more without reading the the set list or the back of a CD. You know what I mean? Yeah. What's sick is we went on so many trips with them that uh, we have live versions of like a lot of different songs that they played. Like they played at uh, Ramona a couple of times. So I have like an acoustic version of him solo playing. Uh, it's either Broken Bottles or um, it's one of those ones. I forget. It, I think it is Broken Bottles, but uh, it's so sick because he's just playing and there's hell of people around and making noise and like everyone's setting up and he just he's into it and nobody's really paying attention. But I'm filming the whole thing. I was like, this it rules. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll throw that on or something. Yeah. Um, yeah run, run that one. Yeah, I think that probably the, I saw him in Seattle for one of the large fest, and I was I've seen him multiple times, but that was probably one of the coolest shows oh, that man, I saw him play. Where he, you know, yeah, his his hometown. Yeah, they they brought it to that show, so sure. that was the first one that sticks out. Rad, yeah. He uh, when we did the skate rock, it was the first skate rock we did was uh, Vegas to Seattle. And the first show was in Vegas and Hubbard was the first act. And he just came out with the intensity and it was so sick. He's like, this is what skate rock is. And he's just made this whole like statement. And then they just went in and it was like, yes, this trip's going to rule. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just broke it off proper, huh? Yeah, seeing them every it's night. And then Trujillo off. got married like two nights later in Reno. Like we did Vegas and Reno like in three days or something. And Trujillo's got married and then we went back down to Sacramento and Johnny and the dudes came and played. And that was a fucking epic yeah. skate in that barn or whatever that thing is out there. And it was a good trip, man. It was a good crew and everything. Yeah. I think Rhino is on that one and hammocky. Actually, we had two photographers. Did Johnny and the dudes go on more than one skate trip? Or no, skate they ride? only, they weren't on the trip. They just met us in Sacramento and they played in Sacramento. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So that was, that was really cool. Yeah. They kind of dismembered after that. I think all of the, it's uh, Johnny and the dads now. They all had kids. <laughs> 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 Things are going good for you, huh? You got a, you got a place and everything. Yeah. Yeah. No complaints. Everything's going smooth. Hell yeah, dude. Well, I, th- I appreciate you taking the time. It's fucking good catching up. And please hit me up next time you come up this way. I'd love to meet up and skate around, get a bite or whatever. Yeah, I'll hit you next time in the bay. Pretty neat. Yeah, we got some stuff cooking. There's there's a few things that have been hitting. Uh, we just built the plaza on Market Street, which is completely insane that they let us do that. Like, I'm still, like, pinch myself every time I go down there. I'm like, are you kidding? Like, can Foosh Construction built something for the city that's skatable? Like, I, it's just, I, you can't yeah. really write this shit. Like, it's crazy. It's pretty cool, yeah, man. Yeah, especially the part of the downtown and sand. Yeah, it's right at the fentanyl zone. Like, I think that's part of their mission is to try to clean all that up, and they think skateboarding will push it out, but who knows what's really going to happen but yeah it's it's cool we got a little bank thing that's real wide we got a long double side curb we got this like thing they call the mohawk it's like a little pyramid with a curb up it into a flat bank and a little volcano too yeah i've seen a random couple of things of it yeah it looks fun and it's just cool that it's in that area because i mean if you're street skating in that that city you end up in that zone already you know the, the library and yeah. federal building and all that stuff so yeah and you're one block from supreme so you could go hit the bowl or something if there's a session there and then yeah like the islands right there emb is right there and yeah it's just it's pretty cool it's it's amazing if they let us start skating the library gap again then it's gonna be really on i wouldn't be surprised well what do you think do you got anything else you want to add that we didn't discuss or anything 
No, I think we're good. This is a good general brush over for sure. Yeah, I'm hyped. Some of that early stuff I didn't know about you. Yeah, I mean, there, there's still like pieces in the middle of that. Like, I spent like a year and a half being incarcerated as a teenager before I even like left. Right. Um, um, like Texas, like I was going through like a lot of stuff as, just as like a 15, 16 year old. I was ended up in like a um, like a court ordered boot camp in Fifth Ward, Houston. For Jesus. six months where you're just like in a place where you don't get to leave and it's like barbed wire fence at the top and it was this yeah, it was this pretty great place to be and I it was funny how uh, that had like a lot of influence as you look back, like that whole time period. Fifth and words then, gnarly, and that's I, like, ghetto boys. Yeah, it's Ghetto Boys. That's uh, DJ Screw. That's like all that stuff is right next to uh, Greenpoint huh. uh, Mall, where, which is Guns Point Mall. If you know anything about DJ Screw and all that stuff, they're always talking about Greens Point. Uh huh. That's where I was for like six months <laughs> for myself, like <laughs> into these chain link fences. Yeah, <laughs> dude. Yeah, so that, that was like that's like a whole another weird subject. And then like uh, I think what was another weird one that kind of yeah so, uh, like the first couple of years in san diego I was still a street skater and uh started skating for gns with when donger ran the program oh no way. So i had like two years running around with Don- that yeah. rules donger's legend yeah i would like go to his house and like uh to meet up to skate and he was always watching kung fu movies before he went and skated <laughs> Like, he never watched, like, a skate video part to get hyped. You know, like, you know, your favorite guy. You're like, all right, I'm going to watch, yeah, you know, this part. And then I'm going to go skate. He was always, like, watching kung fu movies. And he'd be like, dude, check out this kick. Check out this. He'd be, like, so hyped on a certain kick in a movie. And then we'd go skate. <laughs> so sick. <laughs> yeah, Donger rules, man. That's a, that is a... Uh, Absolutely. a really cool character, man. What do you think, like, being incarcerated, like, what... What do you think that you took from that? Like, did it help you in any way in the in your life moving forward? Do you did you learn anything or learn things not to do or like what lessons do you take from that? Um, I think it just makes you really like self sufficient and very aware of like how you deal with people and your surroundings. Mm. But just just within the last six months, I've realized I got a really problem, like a big problem with the authority. Which I always like knew, but I didn't know that I, I let it translate in between like good friends too. Like as soon as like even like a good friend or say anyone trying to help me or something like that, as soon as I saw him as an authority figure, I would subconsciously push back on it and be like, Well, fuck that, I don't like would go against it. Gotcha. And it's something not so recently that I was like, Oh, I didn't know I did this to my friends too. Like that's that's not cool. Like you need to maybe get past that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's one thing to like you know the skateboarders you naturally just don't like stay away from cops and like have a whole thing against that but it's like and I, that's where i thought it ended but it, it slowly found out it was like oh it doesn't just stop there you like you ended up you know relationships or friends or like writing for people like all this stuff like it bled into all of that too mm. but you, mostly you, just how you be aware of your surroundings and stuff like that and how you deal with people really minute do you think it like helps you uh tolerate things more yeah being in other situations yeah you grow um a lot of patience yeah um, and i'll see people trip out on that about me is just like how patient I can be with certain situations like well just been in so many situations where I didn't have the choice and right. had to learn patience from the back end instead right. of the front end mm-hmm. well shit man I, I appreciate you sharing all this with us I, I I think this is a great episode I'm stoked that we did it uh I don't know where Wes is right now but he's somewhere fucking putting back a tall can for his birthday and so that stokes me out too. Yeah, I just tried to have about an hour ago and then I realized he's in Mexico. He's on a crock rip trip down there right now. Oh, he is? Okay. Yeah, so he's gonna he might be a bit hard to get a hold of for 
another week or so. <laughs> uh, he's always somewhere, man. He does not stay still for too long. Yeah, he, he's smart, man. He's like he's doing it while he can. Take Absolutely. advantage of those you know, those opportunities, and he's he doesn't take it for granted. And yeah, he, he's smart for that. Yeah. Well, that's sick, dude. I'm stoked to have you as kind of your first interview like this was with me. So that that I take that to heart. No, no, no. I really appreciate you reaching out to do it, and uh, I was stoked to do it. Like I said, I've like listened to a lot of them, and um, yeah, a fan of, of what you're doing. Yeah, keep rocking, man. You're fucking out there doing the good work. Thanks, dude. I appreciate it. Like, if you, you know, the more you spend time with Rhino, just keep twisting his arm. We'll get him on eventually. He's like, oh, that's not, that's not my, st you know, I'm not, that's not who I am. I'm like, come on, Rhino. We got, we got to do this. Yeah, yeah. I can relate to where he's coming from. Like, you, you're like, dude, like, it almost feels like something. And in some, to some extent, you're like, that could only go backwards for me. <laughs> like, it's not going to, it's not going to help me, like, progress to anywhere. You're like, uh, and I think it's kind of similar where we're both, like, kind of keep to ourselves and quiet dudes until sure. we don't need to be. You know? And yeah. so, like, there's, like, there's some kind of, like, possession to that where you're, like, you're, like, how you're able to curate that. And then to be like on camera doing this stuff is like, it's almost too exposing or something like that, where you're like, oh, this could only take me back. It's not going to like push me forward in any way. Like, why would I do it? You know? So like, I kind of see like where he's coming from, but at the same time, the episode would be epic. Like I want to, I want to hear a random episode. Like I know, because we could, we could just have all callers calling in like, Omar calls in and asks him about his toothbrush collection and how come he doesn't <laughs> use them. <laughs> <laughs> they got yeah, so that, many that funny jokes, awesome. man. Like one time we were on a yeah. trip and, and the whole time everybody, so everybody bought raw hot dogs, right? And everybody's whole uh -huh. deal was to try to hide the hot dog on the other person somehow so like somebody would find a hot dog in their back pocket and, or whatever <laughs> and the one that got right of the most was some i think omar or nav somebody put it under his um his door so like the front door to his car he had like a lever that you uh -huh. open it and there was a hot dog under there so when he opened it the hot dog just fell <laughs> into his hand. Wow. <laughs> and that kind of shit was just uh, like, oh, ah, we got you. Like, <laughs> that was good yeah, times. Yeah, I mean, all, all you guys in your, all you guys in that time period, it seems so awesome. Like the early 2000s, like before internet and like just yeah. very like genuine characters. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, like, it's like my favorite time period in skateboarding to watch is like early 2000s when it was like very like, for the love like not a lot of people were getting like crazy money or any shit like that so like mm. all you guys were doing for like the right reasons and it really shines through in all the videos and like all the magazines and stuff like that yeah we just wanted it to always be fun you know and like some of the funnest times were where we didn't need any money because we were camping every night it was just camping skating camping skating and staying up all night drinking mm -hmm. a beer with your friends and telling funny stories and laughing your ass off and then next day you're at some new place that you're stoked because you've never been like those are the moments where you're just like this is why i signed up for all of this like this is this is the shit. like to me early days going up to oregon and seattle every time we went there was at least two maybe three new parks built so it was like we had our regulars but we also had these new ones that we like gold coast or i forget what they're called but like there's different ones up the and you're like oh we gotta stop we've never been to this one you know myrtle creek like whatever and then you know once wendell's opened it was like okay we're going to Wendell's. What are we hitting on the way? Like that, it was just like, you know, Willis is up there holding it down. He's got the camp spots and everything. And man, those are just the best trips for me. Like taking bass in the river and just, and just, uh, Jamie Weller's hospitality and all that stuff. Like it was labeled the funnest right. place on earth. And I, I, I can't think of some place that 
is funner for me to skateboard that's like I don't know that place has so much and it's out in the woods and it's just like the whole experience to me was like it was definitely one of the best yeah it's definitely a super cool spot but uh weller being at the helm of things up there i think helped a lot like him being such a genuine skateboarder yeah i know peter gunn and zeroch helped build a lot of that too for sure so there's like just good energy in, in that place absolutely yeah yeah for sure yeah we i was up there with zeroch one time uh I never been there with I don't know Pete Pete was there in the early days I think uh he was yeah, there you, one time you remember that hollow meat the oh hollow meat man fucking, off the side down, of yeah that's the- Wendell <laughs> yeah yeah that's fucking Wendell they had yeah. this, like a snowboard like training thing in Wendell yeah, yeah we I were trying it. that and I thought I forget if it was <laughs> it must have been before that because we were trying it and then somebody sent me that video clip and i was like 20 bucks no right here. way <laughs> <laughs> so yeah nice. the fearless peter gun yeah he was, like, he was going for it yeah holy shit well hell yeah man good talking to you again and yeah if, when you're coming down hit me up a day or two before let me know when you're gonna be here and get, get we'll get a little session going or something yeah fuck yeah man i'll be stuck on that all right oh yeah smitty take, take care, care yourself man. all right have a good one bud you too man take care Larry. Comedy hour. broken oh, bottles broken bottles unplugged <laughs> This is A's, went through my veins, infected elbow, oil and grease, the toxic wasteland, right down the street, I'm back in town. Yeah! Woo! Woo! Ah, ah, ah. In the backyard, you got it good, can't complain, nobody listens, it just ain't the same, it's a way blood plus the Thank you for listening to another episode of Talking Schmidt. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. When you subscribe, you'll get notifications every Tuesday of new episodes the minute they become available. Also, please leave reviews and a five-star rating. It's the best way to help the show grow. All of the episodes will always remain free, but if you would like to help support the show, you can do so at TalkingSchmidt.com where you can pick up some merchandise like t-shirts, beanies, hats, and stickers. The website has an entire archive of all of the episodes with extra photos and videos. Email us with any suggestions, comments, or ways that the show may have improved your life at talkingschmidt at gmail.com. All interviews are conducted, edited, and produced by Schmitty. The intro music is Mary's Cross by the band Nature. A very special shout-out goes to the executive director, Cheryl Camisa. Shout out. Love it! This is Talking Schmidt, where the Rolodex is deep, but the conversation is deeper. Keep the wheels greased.